good to Excellent. see you guys so much. Oh, 20. Wow. 22, 25. You did a bad job last week. I had so many people so eager to come in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's been a day. It's been a day. Good day with the, the apprentices. Good discussion. It's been Man. a good day. Yeah. It was. You know, they're all good. Some are just better than others. <laughs> yeah, have you, heard right. that Monty you ever heard that Monty Python song, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life? That's your song. Oh, it's your yeah, yeah. I, I am the optimist of the office, actually. Yeah. So on, on music, all right, guys, here's, as we, we'll, we'll get started in a few minutes, but we'll have a, this little fun banter back and forth. And if it's entertaining to people, great. If not, I apologize. Uh, anything um, that, let me just ask this. Dan, fit, you got one album to listen to the, best, the rest of your life. What is it? And I can include greatest hits, but I think that's a little bit of a cop out. Yeah, that's an easy answer for me. And I will catch flack for this, but my album for the rest of my life is U2's The Joshua Tree. That's pretty good. U2. I think it's one of the, the best complete albums ever produced. <coughs> U2. When is it from? 1987. Oh, must be good. So as, as people are chiming in, let me just set a little, I'll go back and say this in a bit and we get ground rules for our substantive discussion. Um, you, tonight we've decided to use the chat. Don't use the Q&A, right? Is that what we've decided, guys, as you looked into yep. it? What the chat will do is we all can see it and other people can see it. So be careful, <laughs> be, but know that everybody can see it. But yeah, even fire away your, some of your favorite albums or one favorite album. You've got the, uh, the old Desert Island thing. Which it's so funny how dated of a question this is because you can fit, you know, a million songs on a an in, on whatever device you have. Um, so it's not even a question anymore. I, it's fun to think about for a few minutes as we get started here. So you've got you two, the Joshua Tree, Bruce. What, what do you got? Um, I think uh, it will be Lauren Hill, um, the Miseducation of Miss Lauren Hill. I could listen. Yeah. I actually just ordered a vinyl of that, so. Ooh, you're a vinyl guy. To, I'm a like vinyl it. guy. Nice. Yeah. You're such a That's renaissance a good album. man. You're, yeah. That's I'm actually a soul. really good one, Bruce. That, that, I'm really impressed with that selection. Well done. Oh, are you? <laughs> so, okay, uh, Mick. Yeah, um, I guess I, I would probably choose something uh, instrumental in nature. Um, I don't know if I have a specific album to uh, oh, to man. pin down for you. I listen to a lot of Pandora, so I don't know albums. I just I listen to genres of music. I'll I'll break your neat little <laughs> framework here, Pastor Marty, and yeah, I'm just. John Slabaw says the uh, uh, Neil Diamond. I, I I love Neil Diamond, but I have to say I know a lot of people didn't like the album, but the Jazz Singer is one of my favorite albums. So boo me if you want, but that's a that's a good album. I would say. Yeah, that was a cop out, Mick. You're gonna, I'm gonna come back. You're gonna have to come back with better than that. How is that a cop out? You, didn't you just say it's? Did never mind. You've got a lot to learn. Learn. Well, so I'm gonna say um, Joe Bonamassa live acoustic live at the Vienna Opera House is, mm. the, is the album I could listen to over and over again. Um, Billy Joel greatest hits um, would be another one. So when I is get, that one from, Marty? Sorry? When is that one from? The Billy Joel's Greatest Hits? Yeah. No, the one, yeah. the, which one did you say first? Uh, Joe Bonamassa, live at the Vienna Opera House. Uh, um, yeah. When is I, that one from? Um, that is 2013. All right. All right. So I know John Schlebaugh says, hot August night. I'm not, John, I didn't <laughs> ask you. I just was referring <laughs> to the fact that you said Neil Diamond. And so, um, yes. Lori, Lori says Christy Knock was, of course, or Stephen Curtis Chapman. Well, Fran had uh, Miss Lauren Hill CD, so I guess nice. that counts as something. Hot August Night. Thank you, Fran. Hot August Night. Uh, we've got uh, the Neil Diamond Eagles Greatest Hits. Um, oh, that's a crank. I was like, is that Jay? Yeah, it's a crank, of course. Um, Mick, I'm giving you time. I'm giving you time, Mick. Yeah, We're going to um, start with a Bible study here soon. 
I'm looking through my my music here. I <laughs> come on, there's nothing. Like you're not that young. You had, I'm I'm, you had, I'm you not an album. I listen to genres. I'm I'm eclectic. I'm not. I'm uh, I'm I'm cultured and versed, Marty. I'm a Renaissance man. Oh, Judy Hill, James Taylor, absolutely. You're talking a lot about yourself. I, uh... You're putting me on the spot, Pastor Marty. <laughs> All right. Um, how, so, are we, how are we going here? We got about 57 people. Maybe we leave one more minute. Um, so to Lori Matta here, I, I actually met Stephen Curtis Chapman when I was in college. He sang at the Cedarville University. And uh, he sat at my dining table in Chuck's. And I had no idea who he was. Good, good story. All right. Yeah. I just, yeah. That's yeah, my, no, that's my, my claim to, to, I guess, proximity to pseudo-Christian fame. Oh, Mick, you lost. Oh, Mick. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Mick. So those, and then you see Mick, I have to say it, as from Juliet, how about her album? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let me, that's let me, no, no, say, no, no. Hold up. Let me hear back again, dude. I don't listen to the, the albums. I'm all about genre. Don't pin me down, man. <laughs> so I think your minute's up. We're supposed to start the book of Colossians, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, this Ooh, is a great air supply. This is, this yeah, we could go. Uh, on, could go in an hour for this. Thankfully, we've got something much more important to talk about. But <laughs> right. It's a good icebreaker. If you need icebreaker at places, uh, it's always fun to talk music. Um, and uh, Mick, oh, I, I'm giving man. you time to regroup. All right, buddy. I'm, I'm here for I'm you. I'm totally collected, Pastor yeah. Marty. <laughs> of course. All right. So <laughs> I think, I think we, we got people. Hey, hello to everyone. Great to have you logged in. We're, we're grateful that we can be together, even though we can't. Um, and one of the things, just to start out, um, to say, if you weren't here at the very beginning, tonight we're going to, this afternoon, we're going to interact over the chat button, or the chat option um, for this, because you can, everybody can see each other, and that's kind of what we heard feedback last week. It would be great to see all the people around. It would. That's not possible with this format, um, and it would be really hard to pull that off. So, because we can't see each other, at least you can put things in the chat bar, Remember, everyone can see this unless you have a specific question that you want to ping someone. So if you just go down to the bottom of that chat bar and it says two, you can change that and you can, um, you can direct questions to, if you have any questions you don't want everybody to see, you just want us to see to perhaps um, throw out to us four, just change that to Marty and I will try to pick up on that. As of last week, we won't be able to get to all the questions or comments, so please don't feel singled out. One way or the other, if we call in you, don't feel singled out and say, hey, that's a good question. And if we don't get a chance to, no worries. We've got lots of people I'm sure will interact. So interact with questions, comments. Bruce and Mick are going to ask at specific times if you would say, hey, put in something in the chat and do that. And we're going to try to feed that in and get this more interactive than we did last week and at the beginning. Um, we are in the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians is so many great quotes. Um, how many of us dwelled, the word of God dwell richly with you comes from Colossians chapter three. And that's what we're trying to do tonight to let the word of God dwell with us so that we may grow to be more like Jesus, that we may go together in unity, that we may be able to put off sin and put on righteousness and many other things. And we started last week with Colossians one, uh, going from about verses one all the way up to verse 14. And I don't know if, you, if you've been around Old North for any length of time, you've heard some of the key phrases that uh, the end of that section there that we use. We talk a lot about God's great agenda is to transfer uh, forgiven rebels from the kingdom, uh, the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the sun, where that comes uh, from chapter one, verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred mm. us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Uh, and then the rest of the book, especially chapter three, is talking not just how we're transferred into this new great kingdom with a great king, but now that we are there, we're to be transformed to be like him. And that's essentially what chapter three is all about. And so we have this great start to this book where Paul's talking to the bunch of people he's never met. He's praying for them earnestly. He's grateful that they received the gospel and it's taking root 
and he's praying that they will be able to walk in a manner worthy of this great calling they have as being in this great kingdom of the beloved son. So that's chapter one, verses one through 14, just in a very nutshell. As a reminder, we encourage you, if you ha even if you haven't done it yet, read the whole book of Colossians, 15 to 25 minutes. Uh, there's still, you can grab the book, even if you're behind, we're going to be interacting a bit with Captivated by Christ, a book about Colossians. And we were moving into chapter one, verses 15 and onwards. I'm going to turn it over to Mick here and you can lead us, brother. Thanks, Pastor Marty. Evening, everybody. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, hopefully you do, you can open up with us to Colossians. Uh, we're going to be focusing this evening particularly on 1.15 to 2.5. And given that that's not a whole lot of verses, uh, we are going to start off just by reading from God's Word. We'll read in chapter 1, verse 15 to chapter 2, verse 5. And we'll just kind of spend some time thinking together through these verses. So starting in verse 15 of chapter one, this is God's word. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have had for you and for those at Laodicea, for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray very briefly together. Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for its sufficiency. We're thankful that you have not left us without a word, that we can know you, Lord. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would be with us during this time, that Christ would be magnified and that we would leave here with a greater adoration of him than when we began this call. For your glory, amen. 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 So a uh, pretty, pretty powerful passage as we dive into the book of Colossians here past our introduction that we, that we did last week and that Pastor Marty kind of recapped for us. And uh, I just, much like last week, I just want to encourage you to keep those comments uh, flowing in. Uh, we want your thoughts. We want your questions. We want to be mutually encouraged by one another. And uh, we definitely invite you to, to participate in that discussion. But there's certainly some things, uh, particularly in the first chunk here, worth kind of reflecting on. Uh, Paul starts in verse 15, and he's, he's talking about the preeminence of Christ, right? He's talking about the supremacy of Christ. And I think one of the points of, of reflection here is really um, the, the magnificence of, of the incarnation, right? The great wonder of the incarnation, that 
the living God, right? The supreme living God would take upon the, the form of man and, and condescend to come here and live, you know, be, be born and, and walk here for, for 30 odd years, right? Um, what, what comes to mind when we think about that? What is, what is the implication for us as we, as we kind of ponder some of these truths? Um, do you, even, even throwing out that word, the incarnation, what, maybe, maybe not everybody's familiar with that terminology. Uh, what, what, is the, what do we mean when we say the incarnation? And how is that important for us as Christians? Pastor Marty. Yeah. Well, I wasn't, I didn't, I know Dan told me not to talk and he said, the more I talk, the worse this study becomes. So <laughs> absolutely. So, but I figure, uh, you know, no one likes silence on something like this. So uh, well, the reason I, I just find it a really helpful, I'm reading this book with my, my neighbor, my Catholic neighbor, Nick, and, and he, uh, the, on the incarnation. And it was really interesting how the author puts it. The word and from incarn a, um, it's the same root word we the Spanish would use with like carne asada, meat. It hmm. makes the point of like very colloquial that incarnation just means God with meat, and I, I found that really <laughs> interesting, like in a very earthly way. But that's that's how kind of striking it is. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. God with meat, God with flesh, and mm -hmm. so um, yeah, it's just while we know that the incarnation isn't the only thing it presupposes the cross and resurrection god had mm -hmm. to become flesh with meat and afford him to die in the flesh and be raised again uh to be the firstborn of creation um would it be the firstborn of the dead i should say and so yeah it's just it's a fascinating thing yeah verse 19 right the, the fullness of god uh dwelt in him and mm -hmm. so this is the uh it's not as if god gave a part of himself into christ uh, it was the it was the full presence of God in this physical uh, body of of Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point, Pastor Dan, too. And uh, and there's I think three things that we can kind of that tease off from that uh, that are that are all pretty important. One is uh, you know just talking about Christ, that you know the doctrine of Christ. He he was both fully God and fully man. He, he didn't give up some of his power, you know, some of his godness, so to speak, some of his deity in, in taking on the form of man, right? I mean, that's, that has profound implications for where our salvation comes from and, and, and really the root of the Christian faith as a whole. Yeah, what is the, uh, what's the heresy where you believe that Christ actually gave up some of his deity? Is that, is, that's not kenosis, is it? No, we got no. Listen, we're gonna get an answer. Ed Havich is watching. There we go. <laughs> He's got Ed it. Ed Havich <laughs> is on it. Kenosis. Listen, brothers and sisters, seriously, like Ed Havich is here. He's a good, faithful support Absolutely. and leader in helping us think through this. He has thought through the things alike. Question in chapter one, verse fifteen. You know, what does it mean that Christ is the firstborn of all creation? Um, when we said in the Nicene Creed a few years ago, I remember I led that, mm -hmm. and a couple of people asked me, what does it mean he's the big, begotten son of God? Um, Ed Havich is a great, wonderful resource and partner in the ministry. So if you've got questions, you can ping Ed here. Um, Ed would be happy to provide his email. Um, and so please use Ed because he's super helpful in this. But yes, kenosis. Well done, Mick. Sorry, I, I stole your thunder there, Ed. I'm, I'm, I'll look to the comments. Uh, next time, but yeah, that's uh, that's helpful. There, there have been no shortage of heresies, right, concerning uh, the persons of the Godhead throughout history, and uh, and and Chin even talks about this in the book, and it it definitely um, comes into play in the book of Colossians. Here is that uh, what we believe about Jesus, about God, mm -hmm. actually matters, right? We mm -hmm. we have to get these things right. Uh, we're kind of jumping ahead just a little bit here, but it, it, it fits nicely into our discussion. Chin kind of, uh, he, he cited that Nike advertisement uh, in, the, in the chapter, right? He said uh, Nike had this, this commercial that said, just believe something, right? You know, whatever it is, just believe it sincerely. But um, a, a lot of people believe a lot of things sincerely, and, and they're wrong on those mm -hmm. things. And, and when we're talking about the person of Christ, uh, we, we have to know him as he's revealed himself uh, 
to us to be, right? Yeah, I think just piggybacking off of what you just said here, Mick, uh, that's exactly, you know, Paul's writing this to a group of new Christians, newish Christians. Uh, and uh, this is a church that is newly formed, people that are experiencing the gospel and being transformed by the power of the gospel, even as we read in the beginning of chapter one. And really, he then highlights the sufficiency in the presence of Jesus Christ. He starts clarifying this incarnation, clarifying the role of Christ. And as I was reading that this morning, I was just thinking about this a little bit more. You know, why did Paul begin to, to highlight the presence of Jesus Christ here and the reality of Christ? It's because as new Christians, and frankly, as all of us as Christians, it's only really as you understand and surrender to the, to the sufficiency of Christ, to the supremacy of Christ, you know, that's your best protection as a disciple against false doctrine, against theological error. Uh, when you are anchored in the full reality and studying the, the depth and the mystery of Jesus Christ. Bruce, I got a question for you, brother. Um, yeah. I have a friend in, in Sydney who has run an evangelistic campaign in a campus church that they had t-shirts and they had signs that made it said, Jesus is, and they had un, like a line. And they go around and just ask people, who do you, what do you think about Jesus? And just fill in the blank. And I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking about that in verses 15 through 20. Jesus is, as Ron Cohen has said, everything, right? And we see the yeah. specificity from there from the beginning, the creator for, um, of all things, of which the creation is given to and for, mm -hmm. on down to specifically, he's the head of our church. Jesus is right. that. Now, what I want to ask you, Bruce, is, Dan and Mick, myself, we, we're Midwesterners through and through. We grew up in the Midwest. We spent all our time in the Midwest. We kind of have a feel somewhat what people would answer around here. If back in Zimbabwe, you asked that question, Jesus is, what would be a common fill in the blank answer from some of your friend, non-Christian friends there? Mostly he's just a good guy who their, their grandmother used to talk about a lot and they <laughs> like him. Um, yeah, they, everybody likes Jesus, you know. <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's the epitome of goodness in any man. Uh, so I, it's, it's the same in that way. That, uh, so, so concept like this where his deity is spoken about far from, far from what anybody would ever, ever think about him. So, yeah, well, what I found interesting here was, you know, how in these particular verses, how... Um, this is just building onto your question. How, you know, when we talk to each other, or we meet each other, usually ask, what is your name and what do you do? That type of thing. I feel like Paul is also sort of taking the same, uh, he's making an introduction, like this is who he is and this is what he did. Um, yeah. And, and in such striking ways, like th this Jesus created the world, but uh, that's sort of his name. Um, but this is what he does. He's the head of the church and, and so forth. So it's a, it's a very good introduction um, of who he is. Can you imagine, That's really helpful. Yeah. Could you imagine in, in, our, uh, in that context uh, of the higher, the, the governmental structure then, the, the empire, right. and in ver how striking, that you, to your word, I really appreciate it, verse 16, dominions, rulers, and authorities were created for him. Mm. Striking, isn't it? Very yeah. striking. Yeah. Yeah. I strike striking's a good word for it. And it, it kind of just brings us back to uh you know the lordship of Christ, right? He, mm -hmm. he is Lord over everything. Is is we um any thoughts uh or maybe you can recall what what does Paul mean when um when he's when he's talking about thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities? What what are we supposed to think about uh those those kind of terms? Uh anybody tuning in with us? Yeah, that's a great question, Mick. That really is, because that's the language that Paul uses in some of his other writings as well. Mm -hmm. Affirmative, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you, yeah, I know. It's, it's so passionate. You're affirmative. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, affirmative. That's great. All right, Top Gun. <laughs> his middle name. I, I feel the need. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the principalities, right, the dominions, the rulers, authorities, those things, uh, I think are both physical and spiritual in nature, correct? Uh, that, yeah. that Paul is, is emphasize, emphasizing that there's nothing outside of the control of God, outside of the control and reign of Christ. Uh, and uh, man, think about that. Nothing is outside of his 
created and given authority and that all of these things serve Jesus, even the devil. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Luther said, uh, the devil is God's devil, right? That's, uh, yeah. it's so, <laughs> it's such an encouragement thinking about those things. And I think, uh, just to interject a, a very practical point of application is we kind of look around frequently at, at wicked rulers and Kings and leaders and all kinds of things that, that minimally so frequently fall short of the, the standard we'd like them to hold. Um, you know, those, those things don't happen by accident. Those people don't get raised up by, by accident. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Christ, Christ is, he's ruling, you know, he's, he's the King of Kings. Yeah. And, and it's a good reminder as John pointed out uh, on the chat here that um, not everything that we can, uh, not everything's about what we can see. And mm -hmm. so the invisible part the what's going on in the heavenly realms um, we have that kind of, as Joe said, sent us to Ephesians 6, the spiritual battle. So mm -hmm. it's not just the fight with my flesh, it's not just the fight with the rulers of this world, though that's part of it. It's, it's way beyond, it's even, it's well beyond that. Um, I have a question here that's brought up to me. What, what does it mean in verse 17 by when he says, holding all things together? Mm. He is before all things in him, and in him, all things hold together. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, like I think I mentioned last week that this is one of my favorite verses in Colossians. Uh, I think it's talking about en literally anything that we could think of is being held together by, by Christ. So I think about, you know, how people say the world is a really evil place. But I think because of <laughs> Christ holding it together, it's not as evil as it could actually become. Mm. Uh, you know, so literally anything we could think about, including our very own lives, which we cannot hold on together. Uh, he holds them together. That's such, mm -hmm. a, such a great comfort uh, to myself. I think uh, Chin talks about, you know, atoms, you know, he, he goes to the smallest of cells mm -hmm. that we could think about. Uh, all the chemicals in the air, like everything is being held together by him uh, in a very literal sense. The you know, um, home my sorry, I like this cheese, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, and thinking about Hebrews 1, that great similar kind of statement about Jesus. Um, you know, he holds upholds the universe by the word of his power. Um, just as yeah, so everything is held together. I think there's also a purpose statement here. It's, it's certainly the active work of Christ to hold things together, but it's also the idea that back in verse um, 16, where everything was created for him. Mm. And so the glue by which everything's held together from terms of purpose is, is in Christ, is for Christ. Now that's a lot of hard unanswered questions that we probably don't have time to tease into about what does that mean about terrible events and things that are terrible right, happen. Right. How's he the glue? Right. How's he hold all that together? Um, but I think the answer starts with that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, this is a, uh, you know, as Paul really speaks to the sufficiency of Christ here uh, by highlighting the reality that Christ holds all things together. Um, so he is sufficiently able to, control and sustain all of this that we see and even that which we don't see so therefore right he does not require any assistance um to bring salvation to humanity so right. it's, it's not it's not <laughs> christ plus something it's jesus christ uh, and then by saying that he uh sustains the whole universe so why would we ever doubt his ability to sustain us uh, as individuals, right? So he will sustain us to the end, even as we read in the great benediction in Jude, you know, that, that he will carry us through and in Philippians as well. But he, Paul's just setting up this immensity. I think just Paul's picture of Jesus Christ is so immense here. Yeah. yeah. Be, be back home, uh, we, we, we have used the book of Colossians, uh, especially uh, because there's a lot of sort of, uh, it's called ATR, African traditional religion. There's a lot of, uh, witchcraft voodoo type of stuff uh, so when a lot of people get saved they genuinely say there's a fear in them still that uh, I still have some form of allegiance to this stuff you know for my life to work uh, so there's a lot of uh, syncretism you know mixing the mm -hmm. two I'll come to church on Sunday 
But when things really go bad, I'm going to look for a witch doctor. Um, mm-hmm. it, so, and we're going to get into that in chapter two, later in chapter two in Colossians, right? It's, right. I'll, take, I'll keep Jesus, but I've got to add, I need more. I need to add something to it. I need more. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And that really brings our discussion full circle back to believing the right things, right? Not, you know, about Christ, about salvation. It's not Jesus plus something. And uh, even as I was, uh, I was just glancing at the comments here flying across this, Mindy said that uh, the deists got it wrong, right? God, mm-hmm. did, he didn't just create everything and is, is chilling out on a cloud somewhere. He's, he's sustaining this. He's, he's active in his creation and in the life of his children, which back to what you said, Pastor Dan, is a, is a great encouragement. So um, those are all really helpful thoughts. Uh, there are, uh, man, everybody just great comments. <laughs> yeah, I keep looking at those. Those are action. Really, really encouraging uh, the things everybody's sharing. But there are just a few things that I, I do want to make sure we touch on. So I just want to move our conversation forward just, just a little bit here. Um, one of them is in verse 20. Uh, Paul talks about Christ reconciling all things to himself. And um, I, I thought Chin's explanation of this was, was really helpful um, if, you, if you were able to get to the reading this week. If not, we're going to talk about it, so it's, it's, all, it's all good. But um, what, what might be the danger in just taking a cursory glance at a, at a verse like that, at a phrase that is saying all things are going to be reconciled to Christ? I think it's helpful. What do we normally think about when we think about the term reconciliation? I think we normally just think about, you know, us being reconciled, you know, to, to Christ, St. Corinthians uh, 5 uh, type language. Yeah, no, that's good, Bruce. And uh, I think the, the danger is, without a proper understanding, we might be tempted to think that Paul's talking about some sort of universalism here, yeah. right? Where, wherein every single person, you know, is going to be saved in the end. And, and we know that that can't be what he's talking about, right? And again, I, I thought Chin's illustration was really helpful. He, he likens it kind of to an accountant, um, reconciling the the ledger right reconciling the books and balancing everything out he he talked about the sense of a a true peace and a true order in all things and and he kind of did this flash forward to to judgment day right at which point every single person every single thing is going to be reconciled to god either by forgiveness or by judgment Mm-hmm. One of the two, yeah. right? But yeah. either way, it's it's going to have this order about it and be as it should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's not a universalist approach, whereas every everyone will ultimately find their way into heaven, as some of uh, those who proclaim to be followers of Christ have preached recently. Um, this is a reconciliation, a balancing of the books on the positive and the negative side of things. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's by, it's by, I think, the qualification making peace by the blood of his cross. So I guess that takes away any sort of universalism because there is, there is an, an, an agent, you know, to uh, that reconciliation, which is his blood. Yeah, amen. And that's a, that's a great point, Bruce. And it, it just keeps moving us right, right along here. It, we have been, if we belong to Christ, we have been bought by his blood. And, and Paul touches on this further uh, a, a little more in, in chapter two, but he's made peace by the blood of his cross. You know, that's, if there's not a gospel reference in this week's passage, I, I don't know, I don't know what is, right? We've been, we've been bought by his blood. And, and really, it, it kind of, this really relates closely to the, to the whole theme verse kind of of Colossians 2, 6, and 7. As we have received Christ, we need, to, we need to live in light of that. We need to walk in a, in a manner worthy of that. And, uh, you know, we were, we were bought. We were purchased by his blood. Amen. Yeah, I think it, Mick, that, I mean, that idea is also just a reflection a bit of the Levitical sacrificial language in Exodus, right? Uh, Exodus chapter 24 um, we see as, as the Israelites are receiving the law and receiving the sacrificial system, there's this, this act that the, the priest would cast the blood of the sacrifice um, upon the people. <laughs> and I read that just the other day, and I was struck by that, just the connecting point of that, that imagery in Exodus 24, 8. Uh, let me see if I can just read it real quickly here, just so 
make sure we get it proper. Um, yeah, and so in 24, 8, and Moses took the blood and threw it on the people <laughs> and, and proclaimed that, then that's the blood of the Lord's covenant, he says. Uh, and mm. so, you know, it's really just a, a scripture speaks to scripture here. The covenant of, of God is solidified through the blood of the sacrifice. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Dan. That's, that's helpful. It's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's cool to see those, those Old Testament kind of references and allusions, you know, brought up as we, as we think through these things. As we uh, kind of move along here, uh, I think verse 23 is, is really interesting. Uh, I'll back up in 22 here, but it talks about us being reconciled in his body uh, of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So, so this goes back to the, to the practical aspects of the gospel, right? This goes back to our sanctification. The, you know, we, we are being saved unto glorification, unto sanctification, unto holiness, right? Um, that, that we would be presented holy and blameless and above reproach. But this, this verse 23 is really interesting to me. And unfortunately, it, it's, uh, it, it could be a bit of a can of worms, but I, I, still think it's, I still think it's worth mentioning. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. That, that word, if, I, I, it really jumps out at me. It's like, you know, Paul, Paul is almost, he's putting a contingency on this, right? This is true if you continue in the faith. What, what, is, what does he mean by that? How, how are we to think about that? I mean, as I thought, you know, once God saved us, um, we, were, we were his. What, what does he mean if we continue in the faith? What does that look like for us? And, and I'll just, uh, we'll look to the comments here and, and uh, get some of the other thoughts from the other guys. But uh, just to dance around the question, he, he emphasizes not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So again, he's, he's pointing back to what we believe matters, right? This gospel, this faith, um, it's, it, it matters. What you believe matters. And, and, and even the, notice the definite article at the beginning of verse 23 the faith right mm -hmm. it's it's specific it's mm -hmm. this this body of doctrine in in the jude 3 sense of things that was delivered to the saints by the apostles right absolutely yeah i think you guys some really helpful comments here you know joe uh paul doesn't know if all his readers are genuinely saved so there's that if this this idea that hey friends there's there's evidence of true salvation and i think that's what we would say uh, that if you are following Christ, you will follow Christ. <laughs> and there right. are marks of your following of Christ. And, and I, I think it's such a beautiful list that he puts together here. The stability that we have, stability in what, right? We're, we're anchored in the words of Christ. I, I'm in that just, you know, I'll, I'll be done after I say this, but after that idea of stability carries with it that mindset and really the pictures of Christ's words, where he gives the illustration of those who hear his words and do what they say. They're like a wise man, right, who built his house upon a rock uh, and contrast that with a foolish. But that's a that's a, what I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, but that's helpful, Dan. It, it emphasizes mm -hmm. the fact that uh, the Christian life looks like something, right? The, mm -hmm. the evidence, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul talks about us being new creatures in Christ, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the evidence that a, that a genuine work of God has been done in our lives is, uh, is, is that new creature, that... that yeah different life and and that it continues right if indeed you continue in the faith mm -hmm. and I, I think joe's comment too just about paul not knowing if all his readers are genuinely saved right you, you've got to be committed to this yeah, yeah if, if you're a christian you will live as a christian amen right. <laughs> yeah that's that's really helpful uh a couple other things here that i want to make sure we get to is is our time uh is quickly running out. It's been such a good discussion so far, but I want to talk about a little bit what, what Paul talks about, about his suffering, right? In verse 24, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me 
for you to make the word of God fully known. That's, that's really interesting. Maybe that jumped out at you as you were reading that, that Paul talks about what is lacking in Christ's affliction. <laughs> I, I think it would be really helpful as we think about what he means by that to, to consider probably what he doesn't mean, right? That, that might be a healthy place for us to start because we know that the apostle Paul cannot possibly be slandering or saying that there's mm-hmm. something lacking in, in Christ's sacrifice, especially given everything he's already said up to this point and everything that he continues to say after this point, not just in this letter, but in the, in the whole of everything that he wrote in the New Testament. So, so what does he mean by this? I think what he does not mean uh, is that... Uh, the, the cross or Christ's sufferings were uh, insufficient because mm-hmm. we know from the other places in scripture that Christ suffered once for all. Um, many places Paul talks about how, you know, the, the ransom has been paid, you know. So, so that, is, that is not what he is talking about. Yeah, what did, what did Christ's afflictions accomplish? Marty, I'm going to ask you because you're you're quiet for too long. What did Christ's well, affliction told me accomplish? Before we started, you didn't want me to talk much, if, if at all. You said well, that, and so I'm well, going to honor I'm, you as my pastor. I like I'm I like you this. I like permission. this. I'm, I'm giving going. you permission, man. Go ahead and speak. The people need to hear. What did Christ's <laughs> afflictions accomplish? Well, as First Peter three eighteen says, Christ suffered once. This is um, one of the things we want to emphasize to our Catholic brothers and sisters or friends that Christ suffered once, not needing to be suffered, not to suffer again. Some translations say died. You can get there perhaps, but that um, Christ suffered once for sins, died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. And it, it gave the people who put their faith in Christ uh, the ability to be in Christ and to be considered righteous. What, what Paul, I think, is saying here uh, along the lines is that he is not saying we need to fill up, but he is saying that if you read on in context, that he's suffering mm-hmm. for their sake by preaching the gospel. And I think Richard um, says that well in the book, that he is suffering to take, he's the apostle to the Gentiles, and he needs to bring them the gospel, not to re-sacrifice Christ as if they need another sacrifice. But as I think some of the comments are saying this really well, so I appreciate, appreciate you hitting spot on uh, in context there mm-hmm. that we are he is suffering to, to preach the gospel so that they may hear the gospel and receive it and have that presentation of holy and blameless as it says back up there in chapter 1 verse 22 um and so yeah it says it he says it in a way that i think you know we always got to be careful like i wouldn't have said it that way so sometimes we think that way about scripture but as uh, the guy who in- encouraged me greatly in ministry, Philip Jensen, would say, anytime we come in at a problem, in a, a problem verse in scripture, it's actually a great opportunity for us to learn and grow and think. Um, and we know, because we know the problem's not with scripture and the problem's with us. And so yeah. what is it going on and us not understanding what, what he's saying there, but what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? And I think, again, great, grateful to so many brothers and sisters out there chiming in and say, he is paying the price for preaching the word of God. And so he's filling up um, that suffering for the sake of the Colossians. Right. Yeah, right. That's, without the afflictions of Christ, we don't have the gospel. <laughs> right. And so, so at the very core level, Christ's afflictions give us the gospel message. What Paul is now doing is taking that gospel message as all of us should be doing and engaging and spreading that gospel to the world around us. And in doing so, there is going to be suffering that occurs as you proclaim that Christ is the only way to be reconciled to the Holy God. Uh, and so uh, Paul is, is I think, really just, the language is, like you said, Marty, the language is a little bit confusing to us, but it's not contradictory. Uh, when you look at the context of the passage. And, and the other thing important is that we believe in the doctrine of the ascension, which is not talked about. Jesus is ascended bodily in heaven. There's no more suffering. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is it, impassable in this sense. And so um, now the suffering is for, as Paul says, 
to be a steward, a minister, uh, according to the stewardship from God was given to me. So now Paul's here to suffer, mm-hmm. not sacrificially, mm-hmm. but from a ministry perspective. Now it's Paul's turn. And kind of, of course, our human nature, I admit, I hear that as a, as a minister of the gospel. And one since we're all ministers of the gospel, we've been passed down the call to suffer. And so I, oh, I honestly, I don't like that. Uh, just to be fair to my own feelings, but this is the, the kind of the full teaching of God. Like, what a great honor. Uh, because he goes on to say, right? It's what will make us mature in Christ, verse 28. And in the passage, I think Mick so helpfully brought up last week, verse two, in Christ, um, or in verse three in chapter two, are hidden all the treasures and wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. So, boy, if there's anything we're suffering for, it's this, right? Yeah. Right. Don't be surprised by it, right? Don't be surprised when it happens. Yeah. Don't don't count it strange, right? That's, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Peter talks about that. Page 57 of, of the book, uh, Lori Matter helpfully posted on for all of us to see. God's infallible strategy to reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus, the prayerful proclamation of Jesus to all the nations through suffering. Mm. I just think it's such a, a, a glorious uh, description of uh, gospel work and, you know, the end goal. Uh, Paul talking about his suffering uh, and then in, in verse 29, talking about how he struggles and toils with his energy. Yeah. Uh, but the end goal is that this message about the hope of glory, uh, you know, he talks about, he presents it as the hope of the gospel uh, earlier on, in, I think in verse 22 or something. Then he talks about the, um, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. All, mm-hmm. all this beauty birthed out of suffering, struggle, and toil. Like, like this message is not like any other message in the world, right? It's, yeah. It can only be, be wrought by God. <laughs> I think sometimes we think, uh, uh, back to 127, you know, think about this great mystery. We think of so much of there's, God is mysterious. And yeah, there is a sense we want to hold on to that. But most of the uses of uh, mysteria, myst- mystery in the New Testament talk about what now has been revealed to us and what's revealed right. And it's, we've got this great mystery and it's a little bit anticlimactic to us, right? Because now we know the mystery is that the Gentiles will be brought in. Think, okay, okay, great. But think about that as that applies to our neighbor and what we, we should and I hope would be willing to say is like, God is for you <laughs> and God Amen. is for the sinners, uh, the reprobate, the outcast, the lepers to use the, and, and, and that is that kind of great message from, from the Jewish standpoint. Wait, God yeah. is for these people now? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And then what that means for me and you is God, you mean God can be for me? Absolutely. And boy, mm. how's that lift our countenance up? And I hope yeah. that message we're willing to take to our neighbors, this mystery um, is now revealed in Christ that anyone mm. in Christ can be holy and blameless. So if that is not something I'm willing to go out and suffer for, that message, then uh, I, I doubt I've understood it myself. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, that's, that's good, a, Pastor Marty. Sorry, go ahead, Bruce. No, I was going to say that Marty's last comment is pretty, it's pretty insightful because Paul presents that and then he says, for this I toil. It's almost in his mind, I think it's almost like, ah, you know, for this I yeah. toil. Like this is, this is worth any anything that that will come my way as an apostle to the gentiles so yeah Yeah. pastor marty you're sorry go ahead no please go i I was just going to say your your comment made me think of uh page 60 in chin's book um he quoted john stott and uh just to pull that bold sentence out of there he said the greatest single secret of evangelistic or missionary effectiveness is a willingness to suffer and die what what you said just made me think of that. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I on this. I'm interesting. I'm, I'm gonna bring this up. Leah Stoffer, great question. Page fifty one from mm-hmm. the book. Um, most of the way down, uh, last full paragraph. In other words, kind of in other words to all what we've been saying. This is the kind of summary section for this part. 
Jesus will not return until the appropriate number of martyrs has been reached. In Colossian terms, what is lacking is a sufficient and complete number of martyrs. Anybody want to comment on that? So I, I jumped to ask the question, so I don't have to answer it. So <laughs> great smart. question, Leah. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, I mean, I guess in my mind, even uh, just backing up, he, he cites Revelation 6.10, right? When, yeah. um, when those who have been martyred are crying out to God asking, hey, when, when are we going to be avenged? When is, when is justice going to, to reign fully and finally here? And I, I just think it, it, it makes reference to, back to the question of in God's providence, there, there being a specific number of of martyrs that, that will eventually die just, just in the same sense that, you know, we, we know that there will be in heaven, uh, people from every tribe, tongue and nation, but in, in God's wisdom, he, he has a number like in his elect will all be ushered in and yeah. gathered into himself before the end. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that's kind of analogous of what he's talking about here. Is it 144,000? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Now, let me say something. I think, I'm curious what you guys think. Uh, this is sincere. Like I don't have a firm final conclusion on this because, again, I, I really appreciate the question. It's worth thinking through. But as the gospel goes out, what we know for sure will happen is that, well, three things, they overlap. Some people, will, in God's kindness, will accept, fall, and worship God, repent, and call upon him. Some people will refuse and even go more hardened and callous to the message and overlapping that when the gospel goes out suffering will happen and persecution will come and so in one sense we kind of wrap in revelation that jesus will come when the gospel has been preached to all the world right if the gospel is preached to all the world suffering and persecution will happen to all the world and if suffering and persecution will happen to all the world people will be martyred for the faith and so I'm trying to tie this together and see what you guys think is that that what Chin is getting at is that more martyrs need to happen because more gospel has to go out to the whole world. Um, and so there's a proportionality. The more the gospel goes out, the more they're martyrs. And I don't say that lightly and I don't say that cal uh, in a cavalier way, but it's just trying to put some of this together. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I think th this is, um, we, we sometimes fall into the mindset that, uh, well, all the world has been reached, maybe. We think that <laughs> the world has heard the gospel, right? And, and I think that that's really so far from the truth. I was just speaking on this for C.S. Lewis a couple of weeks ago, uh, just about the reality that the gospel has not reached the whole world. I'm trying to find my notes here, but yo, here we are. All right. Uh, there are 17,000 ethnic groups in the world. Uh, and out of those 17,000 ethnic groups, ethnic people groups, the best guesses are that 7,000 of those groups would be considered unreached. Uh, and so unreached means less than 2% of that people group has, has heard the gospel. So 7,000 of the 17,000 people groups have been unreached. Now, here's where this number gets even bigger. Uh, they think, and this is all loosely estimated, but they think that that 7,000 people group or 7,000 people group number is around 2 billion people. Uh, and so that's significant, man. And I think yeah. we oftentimes rest and say, oh, the gospel's out and about. People have heard it. They just need to respond to it. No, man. There are people, even in Canfield, Ohio, who don't know the truths of the gospel. Uh, they haven't heard it. And so, man, yeah. we can never, ever rest and say that it's been out and about. You know, it's a, a few years ago now, it, it really, I remember, I wish I remember our brother's name, but he's um, a missionary support in Japan. Maybe someone can chime in in the chat. He's a dear brother who does really good work, but I remember him saying this stat that just hit me, that the Japanese are the second most unreached people group in the world. Now, mm. I'm sure there's kind of different orders and stuff, but point being, we tend to think they're, in, in a sense, they're a Western sophisticated society, in a sense of that they are modern as we like to say in a very condescending way. They have technology, they have access to information, they have the space and freedom in the sense to, to learn, to go and in, 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 intake and vibe ideas um, that other societies don't. And so it struck me because they're very much unreached to your point, Nan. Mm -hmm. And so I just think it's just a, 
uh, uh, we need to hear this, that the gospel has to go out to more people and it will come at the expense of suffering, persecution, and even our own lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it and well I think it's, yeah, and I think it's, it's very also important to, to note that Paul's burden doesn't seem to be just like a, to, to have contact with these people and tell them about Christ and then leave. You know, he's talking about that Christ may be fully formed in them. There's an aspect of maturity, which means, which means you might actually die because you're actually investing your, your, your time, your life, your resources into, into these people. Because uh, sometimes I, I fall into the default of, well, there are people that are unreached. Let's get the gospel to them and come back wherever we are safer. You know? But it's, right. it, Paul wants to present them mature, and that's where I think the, the rubber hits the road. Yeah, that's, that's really well said, Bruce. And uh, just an important reminder uh, for all of us to be, to be about this work. And it even goes back to be presented, being presented holy and blameless, right? You know, and, and walking accordingly. It's not just, uh, it's, it's an ongoing work, right? Yeah. Both in our hearts and in our lives and, and in ministry. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, Nick, Nick, can I just say something? Um, just so make sure we leave with some, some uh, I think, applicable what to do with this because i i think many of us have been in a situation like oh, i hear about these unreached people groups i hear that there's so many people who don't hear the gospel i need the gospel needs to go out um chapter 1 verse 28 gives us the means it gives us it's paul's mission statement but it's also can be ours in the sense that how does paul what does paul want he wants everyone presented mature in christ how we present mature in christ being in christ <laughs> Uh, blameless and holy. And how does that happen? Proclaiming, warning, teaching everyone about him. Mm. Um, and that can happen in many, many different ways. But what that means is that we have access and a calling to participate in this. This is mm. not concealed or uh, reserved for a special few um, because Christ is, as 1 15 through 20 says, he's all. And so mm. we have that calling as well. Um, yeah. That's, that's a fantastic application yeah. for that, uh, Pastor Marty. Uh, we, uh, we are at 527 here. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I need in 90 seconds, I, I, did get a, I did get a question through email that I'm going to direct towards Pastor Dan and Pastor Marty because it's specifically about Old North. And uh, you've got 90 seconds. And then I want to <laughs> take one application from the book. And then I'd like to pray together and, and try to do all that and still be respectful of, of the time here. So the question is, how does Old North work against persecution of Christians in other country? Do we support Open Doors or another group actively working against persecution? What should we be doing as individuals to work against persecution of Christians? And obviously that's in the context of suffering for the gospel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great question. I mean, Marty, I'll let you address it from the Old North side because you've got a little bit deeper history here, kind of knowing how that we've engaged in that regard. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for letting me talk, Dan. I appreciate that. Uh, I, <laughs> jerk. I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> not, um, I want to say this carefully because I can't speak. Um, I'm not on the missions committee. Um, does it give you an excuse? I just don't want to speak over. I don't want to overreach, mm-hmm. but I will say a couple things. One is that um, I think implicitly we have a strategy that we support people who we trust on the ground, who are preaching and teaching the gospel and help to ameliorate persecution. And I know different ministries emphasize different things throughout, um, but our, on our strategy, our tactic, I should say, is that we support the people on the ground that we trust from a character standpoint, as best as we know, and we trust uh, have the method of this ministry in, in 128 and 29 that they're they're toiling and suffering preaching teaching the gospel presenting people mature in christ and from then that down that comes down into the people they are ministering to to do good to the neighbor part of teaching and people about christ is to love their neighbors um and and that helps i think um in terms of a broad level, do we support open doors? And like, I, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, we have a number of yeah. people and groups we support, but I just wanted to give you kind of the inner core, concentric circle wise, inner core of our, our philosophy, who we support, people who, who line up with what we think is a biblical vision for ministry, and then believe that we, can, we can't solve the problems, but we can ameliorate 
and to do some tactical things on the ground there, and we would support that. I don't know yeah, if that's helpful yeah. or not, but yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take the second part of that question too, though. The uh, what should we be doing as individuals to work against persecution of Christians? Um, it's a it's a hard question, right? We care about our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted, and uh, as I was thinking about that question, even just now, I'm thinking, how did our uh, our brothers and sisters in the New Testament deal with that question? You know, how do they work against persecution of Christians? What did Peter do? What did Paul do? Uh, they said they, were, they prayed for those that were in the midst of persecution. They wrote that we shouldn't be surprised when it happens. But then they ultimately, uh, this is where it gets me goosebumps even now to say this. Um, it, ultimately, they said Christ is worth it. <laughs> right? They reminded yeah. their brothers, uh, Jesus is worth whatever it is that we give up on this earth. And so, uh, sure, we want to actively be a part of bringing peace and unity and, and fighting against unnecessary persecution of our brothers. But we also in the same breath need to say, don't be surprised when this happens, but he is worth it. Uh, Christ is worth it. Hmm. Amen. Amen. And that's a, that's a great place to kind of, to end our time together today. I, I had one comment uh, from Chin's book on page 59 that I really think hits it an application for really everything that we've discussed from beginning to start tonight. At, at the last paragraph there, he writes, once you start to see Christ clearly, it will fuel you to persevere in godliness and in gospel ministry. And that, and that really does encompass everything that we've talked about tonight. And, and I think about uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, uh, he writes, uh, he starts off and he just says, consider him talking about Jesus. So it would do us well to consider him as, as we think about things that are unseen, as we think about where our hope lies, as we think about the fact, as Pastor Dan said, that, that he's worthy. You know, we, these things carry us through the, the hardships and the sufferings that we spent so much time talking about. It's, it's where our hope is ultimately rooted. So that's where we have to fix our gaze upon, upon him and upon the the hope that he's given us. So um, really, really appreciate everyone's comments and questions this evening. I just want to encourage and remind you to, to be checking the, the Facebook page and the, and the website for the events going on throughout the week. We've got coffee and conversations. We've got, the, the live stream service on Sunday. We have a sermon discussion on Monday and prayer meeting on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just be mindful of those things. We, we look forward to seeing you there. Dan and I are going to do a sing-along, an acapella sing-along night, right, Dan? We are not. Yeah. But, tomorrow, but tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., right? We want to oh. emphasize this. Tomorrow at 10, we got uh, Chris and, and Reggie doing some singing. So we yeah. want to be uh, that coffee and conversation tomorrow morning is, is Reggie and Chris. So if you want some, some, uh, <laughs> some worship music playing uh, in the background while you work, there you go. Andrew Stoffer, the, you know, the Eagles cried. That was a song that I wrote. Um, so maybe someday I'll perform that for you all. Uh, and uh, it'll be wonderful. <laughs> uh, right. Bruce, would you mind uh, closing us in a brief word of prayer, please, and our time together? So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace towards us. Lord, thank you for the sufferings of Christ, which uh, subsequently uh, brought us eternal life and reconciliation with him. Lord, we thank you for your word, uh, where we see Paul's heart, uh, that we would see you more clearly uh, as preeminent, as Lord of all, as the head of the church. Um, so we pray, Lord, I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters on this webinar that we would uh, grow more uh, clearly in our seeing you, uh, that Lord will love you, will follow you, and uh, use the rest of our days proclaiming you to others. Uh, Father, give us the courage. Uh, we pray that we will take every opportunity um, with the seriousness that this gospel uh, deserves. Uh, thank you for your goodness and your grace. It's through your son's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Nice, uh, nice engaging you here. Thanks for your comments. All right, everyone. Hey, this will be recorded. It has been recorded, and it will be posted on the church's YouTube page tomorrow. Uh, if for some reason you want to watch it again, or if you want to refer someone to watch it, it'll be on there tomorrow. So. God bless you all. Uh, we'll, as Mick mentioned, we will see you all, Lord willing, soon, but we'll see you virtually 
um, the variety of things that are offered here uh, at Old North Church. So God bless you guys. Have a good uh, evening and enjoy the sun while it's out.